Warning, this game contains content that might not be suitable for most audiences. For full content warnings, please check out the game page. How's it going everyone, my name is Lion, and welcome back to Corn and Cowboys. Now, I just realized we actually forgot to check out like two of the other love interests from our last playthrough, so hey, let's go ahead and check them out and see what we're going to be doing today. You walk along the path past the sheriff's office, but to find the rest of Summer Fair, where would you like to go? Uh, let's head to the creek. You walk along a small path, putting yourself next to the creek. What would you like to do? Um, uh, approach the strange clown. You approach the strange clown, pausing when he seems almost startled. He stares at you, eyes wide and glossy, like two strange marbles. Uh, hello? How would you even get to know this guy? He stares at you, and under his clown paint, you can see him turn a bit red, the flush crawling down his neck as he looks at the floor. He parts his lips as though to speak before mumbling something incoherent to himself. What? He peers up, startled yet again before he turns away from you, beginning to walk along the river. I will follow him. You follow him with a bit of curiosity. What is up with this guy? He doesn't seem to notice you follow as he walks across the creek at a more shallow point. The water is loud and catches you off guard. All he can do is stare at the water, then at the back of his head. What do you do? Uh, I'll wade through the water. Beside, there's no harm in just walking across, right? You take a step into the water, your shoes surprisingly durable. You attempt to hurry, finding that the creek so far reaches to about your calves. Honestly, it isn't so bad. The cool water lapping against your skin as you trudge across. That is, until you can swear you can feel something brush up against your leg. You pause, realizing that you're stuck about halfway through the creek water, reaching just your knees. And you feel it again. What the hell? Uh, run across. You bolt, running along the slick stones, your body losing balance occasionally, but adrenaline pulls through. You're close, and slowly but surely, the water goes from knee height to calf height down to your ankles. Finally, you reach shore, turning to look back at the water, as if that would answer the question in your head. What was that? You realize you have to focus on the task at hand, letting out a small breath of reassurance before turning back to the woods. Following the black mop of hair ahead, you make your way off the shore and onto the woods on a small, man-made path. From the looks of it, it was made purely from walking alone. You must travel this path every day. You follow a bit, making sure to keep a couple yards back. Anytime you step on a branch and walk through the thicket, the strange clown man walks faster. Ugh, will this guy ever slow down? Finally, he comes to a complete stop, seeming to be staring ahead towards wherever he was going. Um, I will get his attention? I have no idea what's the right thing to do here. Decide to throw a rock to gain- That's not gaining his attention! Hello? You grab a rock from the forest floor, tossing it ahead. It crashes into some bushes, and it freezes and turns around. He grasps his hip for something, but from being unsuccessful, he begins to bolt, running away. Hey! Wait! You call, beginning to run after him. Though he seems that if he's trying, he can easily surpass you. Ah, oh, frick. You lose sight of him pretty quickly, slow to a jog. Frick. Maybe you can try again tomorrow. I'm gonna try again tomorrow. I'm rolling back. I'm gonna stay quiet instead and see where this takes us. You stare, gulping a little. What is he doing? After what feels like a while, he sinks to his knees, leaning down and beginning to dig in the ground from the looks of it. With his bare hands. You need to browse together in confusion, feeling as though you're almost intruding on something meant to be private. Maybe you are. I mean, you did follow this guy into the woods. He sits up after a while, holding up something. Uh, skull. You freeze up, heart beating loud. So loud you can't hear the woods or the creek or the sound of his footsteps as he continues to walk ahead. You aren't sure what to do. I will follow him. You decide to rationalize it. You didn't see him kill anyone or anything. But why would he bury a skull? Better yet, why would he unbury a skull? You let him get a bit ahead before you start to walk, pulling him as every couple of yards he stops, to get down and checking the earth. Sometimes he doesn't pull anything from dirt, other times he does. How does he know where these holes are? You pass each spot, and after a couple, you notice that the trees are marked. A small scratched W. Huh. By the eighth one, he seems done, because now he's walking faster. 
You attempt to catch up without making too much noise, but find it difficult to replicate his soft steps. Finally, he reaches a small clearing. You hide behind a tree to watch. He turns quick, holding up the skull and looking it over. He has wire and rope, putting it together against something next to the tree. More bones, animal, and some human. It's alright. I have you now. Don't worry. He comforts the bones as he sits down next to them. He sheds his coat, leaving it on the floor as he works, attaching the skull to a sort of body. It's quite alright, I know, but the dirt was necessary. He murmurs this as he brushes off some old dirt from the skull's st structured crevasses. Maybe he's just incredibly lonely. Eh, seems like it at least. You aren't sure what to make of it, and when adjusting your hiding spot, you step on a branch. His head turns like a deer being alerted, eyes wide as they land on you. He's stiff, unmoving as his mouth falls agape. The ability to speak seems to have been sucked out of him merely at the knowledge of your presence. You both make eye contact, the whirl in slow motion as he shoots up, beginning to run at you. Holy! Before he can fully react, he attacks you, arms grasping you as you both fall to the floor. He's panting, scarily strong despite his body weight, as he uses one hand against your head, palm smashed against your mouth and nose, the other holding your arm down. Uh, try to reason with him? Wait, stop! His breath is heavy, his weight keeping you down as you attempt to get him off of you. Please, I didn't mean to. You find that with your pleas, you start upstairs, as if to listen to you. This is your chance. I just want to see what you do. He stares, almost as if he doesn't believe you. You stare up at him, his deep blue eyes meeting yours. It feels so strange. He almost looks a little lost. Then, he slowly gets up off of you. Why is the clown man hot? Why is he blue and hot? God damn. He pulls something from his hip. A long, strange blade. It's a threat. You're frozen on the floor, forest floor for a moment, wondering if he's hurt people with that knife before. You watch his Adam's apple bob as he gulps, mumbling incoherently. We just heard this man speak moments before, but now he just can't seem to. Um, attempt to converse with him. You slowly sit up, making sure to give him room. Then you stand, staring at him with big eyes. You decide to stay strong, despite how freaking freaky this guy is. You'll pursue it. Why not? Though, out of the million things you could ask, what do you do? He seems a bit freaked. His knuckles are white with how he grips the knife. Oh, ask about the knife, the buried bones, ask about the skeletons, ask about the clown makeup. I'll ask about the skeletons. How do you make those skeletons? They weren't exactly human, partial animal and partial people. Your eyes wandered to them. His eyes jolt up, as if you caught him in the act of doing something vulgar. He thinks, eyes darting around before he finally finds a back on you. Company. You sort of start to realize he is heavily misunderstood. Freaky, but misunderstood. You take a step towards him, deciding to test the waters a little bit. He seems nervous, but doesn't budge, and you successfully move towards him. Um, ask about the knife. Why the knife? You gulp, feeling a bit threatened by it. He pauses to look from you, down to the knife in his hand. He takes a deep breath. Self-defense. You gotta help a wonder. They get a step towards him. Why would a guy like you need self-defense? You find yourself almost amused and confused, trying to play it up so you aren't so cowardly. He looks around and slowly but surely, you seem to be breaking this man down. The woods are dangerous. There's a beast out here. And people... Take another step, slowly bridging the gap between you two. With your interest in him, with that hostility or fear, the script seems to loosen on the knife. Um, about a clown makeup? Why do you have this stuff on your face? The makeup? He smiles at that, shockingly responsive. I want to make people enjoy being around me. He sighs. I just have to enjoy being around them first. He shrugs a little, looking uncomfortable speaking so closely about that. I mean, honestly, I'm starting to love Will a lot more. Gosh darn it, he's such a big baby and I love him. He finally bridged the gap completely, leaving you standing in front of him. It's a bit threatening to look up close, but you think you understand him a little more. 
It's almost enjoyable in a weird way. Is there something wrong with you? A shiver runs down your spine. You nod slowly. You think you've got enough information. You take a few steps back. I'm going to go, all right? He stares and slowly nods, as if to give you permission. The creek is that way. He points past you, making it clear. Thank you. You turn and begin to walk away. What was that even? What was that about? What the hell was that whole interaction? It feels so strange and bizarre. After a while, you pause, feeling eyes on you. In fact, you swear you can hear him following you now. I earned a stalker. Ah, uh, what? You hasten your steps, heading off to find the creek again. After a while, you can hear it. Roaring water. It's the creek. Yay. You're finally back. What would you do? Uh, well, maybe I'll pick some berries in the meantime. Okay, so we managed to do a bit of fishing and uh, got some forageables. And this time I do want to check out like the last guy, which we haven't checked out yet. So let's head over to the sheriff's office. You enter the sheriff's office, but something is different. There's a man standing next to the usual sheriff. It's unfamiliar to you. You approach the two and the sheriff's eyes perk up. Oh, lion. This is an officer from the other side of town. He comes in on weekends to help out. He may be a young'un, but don't let that face fool you. He means business. Attention turns to the younger man, probably in his late twenties. Hello there. It's nice to meet you. You can call me Officer Florence. Of course. It's nice to meet you too. One thing you note is this mad, strong foreign accent. You give them both a nod before turning and heading out the door. Wait, what? I want to get to know Officer Florence. You approach the two men. The one is in your sights. The usual officer doesn't seem to be paying much attention. His gaze is at the floor. The unfamiliar one, however, seems to be giving you his full attention. Brows slightly raised as his blue eyes stare into your soul. Uh, flirt? I'll ask where he's from first. Sorry if this is forward, but I'm a bit curious about where you come from. I remember the officer mentioning a uh, little rob, but I don't remember people from there having fancy accents like yours. His lips widen a little into a soft smile, as if it isn't that common for him to hear. France, despite my name, I'm from a small town there. French. Well, uh, I don't know if I can pull off a, like, a French accent that's not gonna, like, get me cancelled. <laughs> you don't quite understand what he means regarding his name, but otherwise, it makes sense. Ah. Ever met someone from France before? Have you been living here long? You try to make a good conversation, curious about him. Eh, uh, in the States or in Little Rock? He laughs softly, adjusting himself so his hands are on his hips. His head turned a little as he looks at you. In Little Rock? Maybe four years? He shrugs, eyes focused on yours as he speaks. It, it really draws you in. He parts his lips to speak, but before he's able, someone bursts through the door. Officer, I need help, please. She looks worried, eyes wide and big, pretty red lips trembling as Jed's head pops in alert. Manolia? Jed sits up straighter, adjusting his vest as he looks at her, a careful softness to his expression. What's the trouble of you, sweetheart? Florence peels his eyes away from you, straining up and letting his hands fall to his sides. Well, sir, my room has been broken into at the salon. Well, I wasn't sure what to do. She settles awkwardly. I assumed it was one of my patrons, but I've never shown him my boudoir before. Her eyes wander from the floor back up, dancing between you, Officer Florence, and Sheriff Jed. Some jewelry was stolen, a couple other things. If you'd like to go, look. Haven't touched anything since I got home. Jed reaches out, petting Florence's shoulder. With an understanding nod, Florence nudges you. Then he walks out, following Manolia as he steps in the doorway. Are you coming? At first, you think he's referring to Jed, at least until you meet his stare. No! Oh! You follow quick, almost delighted for the invite. It seems he trusts you enough for something like this, huh? You both follow Manolia through Summerfair Town Square. She has a bit of a nervous pep to her step, that... That you can tell too much. For a moment, you wonder what Florence picks up on. You look at his expression, cold and straight. Huh. And then you enter the salon. Following Manolia, you both head to the side staircase. 
Up the stairs and down the hallway are a couple rooms. She unlocks and opens one with a large skeleton key. You both enter Manolia's room and it is... Wow! The smell of perfume, the first thing you notice. The room is currently in a chaotic state, and part of you wonders what it looks like normally. Mind the mess. It's as if she read your mind. So, about what time were you gone, ma'am? Florence parts from your sight, beginning to walk around the room. I was gone about 8 p.m. yesterday to about 6 a.m. this morning. She holds herself in her arms. Florence nods in response as he peers around. Line, can you ask us some questions for me while I look around? He offers you a small leather-bound notebook and what seems to be a nub of a pencil. Uh, I'll interview Manolia. Ah, uh, sure. You take the notebook from him and a small pencil. You sit up a little, adjusting yourself before turning and look at Manolia. You're unquite sure what to ask at first. If anything like this has happened before, what exactly happened soon? Maybe it's a good idea to ask uh, what has been stolen. So, what exactly was taken? You look around, biting your lips at the mess. I had a jewelry box in my vanity. It was all vintage. My mother's. She sighs softly, clearly a bit distraught about losing something so dear to her. Whoever came and stole the box as well, pursued the whole thing and ran off. Along with that, I'm missing some more uh, personal garments. She looks away with a small, light-hearted laugh. Her face turns a little red at the thought of what she means. You scribble down some notes against the rough pages. Ah, ask her if anything like this has happened before. Has anything like this happened to you before? Browsing it together as she looks at you. Well, I mean, not to this degree. A month or so ago, someone broke through my window. Did you report it? She looks a little uneasy before laughing. Nah, nah, silly. I know I should have, but whoever it was didn't take much. She sways a bit. Looking from you back to Florence, who is currently poking around nearby the window. Much. Her head snaps back to you before she laughs. Just one of my scarves. Nothing too special. It was red with polka dots. It was on my nightstand before that incident. For a moment, you wonder if she misplaced it somehow. Then you remember. One of the skeletons had a red scarf on. Ow! Oh, well! From the woods. Huh. You might know who is responsible. To scribble down some notes against the rough pages. Huh. Ask if she knows a Will Curtis. So Manolia. This might be strange, but you know a man named Will. Her eyes light up for a moment before she quickly looks away. I know plenty of men by the name of Will. You'd have to get more specific, sweetheart. Will Curtis? Add the name. She's quick to speak. Wh what? What does he have to do with this? At a sharp words, Florence quickly approaches your side. Decide to keep him up to speed, handing him the notebook. Well, ma'am, I believe he stole your scarf. I won't explain the details, but I'm sure I saw it in his possession. She sighs a little. Me and he and I were friends a long time ago. When I was a kid, he used to come up here for the summer to spend time with my uncle Jed. Jed is your uncle? She shrugs. At a time, it was good friends with Will's father, Harris. So he was really the only company I had up here. We thought I had a fallen out. She looks at the two of you with a soft, almost sad expression. He wouldn't have stolen the jewelry. He wouldn't have known how much it meant to me. And well, if he did, he's not all that bad. It's a bit weird, I swear. You'd think she's missed out some serious character development over the past 12 years. You look from her back to Florence, who's giving you an inquisitive brow. You don't want me to investigate any further? Not if it has anything to do with him, alright? Maybe look into some other people, thieves in the area or someone else. You part your lips to argue, but you feel Florence's hand press on your shoulder, giving you a soft squeeze. Of course, ma'am. No trouble. We'll look into other sources, right? You clean up. We'll get back to the station and write you up a report. Swing by any time to write a statement, okay? She nods, finally uncrossing her arms to relax. Thank you both so much, and you, Lyon, I really hope you find a different lead. You and Florence head out of the salon, pausing back in Summerfair Town Square. Remember, you still have his notebook. Here, you hold out the small, leather-bound book. 
Ugh, oh, must be God. Thank you. He takes it from your hands. You sure it's that hill guy? A will? Lauren stops near a tree, leaning against it and looking down at you. Oh, God. Oh, man. Rat will out. I'll pass it off as a hunch. Oh, this is tricky because... Oh, I don't know if Will's a bad guy. I mean, heck, he, he, he might be a stalker, but still. Oh, oh, but I... God, I like Florence better. I freaking... Oh, Florence is so hot. I'm gonna rat Will out for the Floresi. I'm not positive he stole a jewelry box, but I'm sure he's broken into a room before. There's some weird collections in the woods, and along with that, I swear I saw a red scarf, the exact one she described. You look from Florence to the cobbles, which leads down from the branch off to the woods. Oh, well, I'll look into it. You know, lad, I really appreciate your help. While I was looking around the room, I noticed that whoever broke in must have been looking for something specific. Whether it was her undergarments or uh, the jewelry. Looks away from you, awkward before he shrugs. Nothing else aside from those, those two spots were strewn about. Normally a robber that hasn't been to a place before would tear up the whole place. So your theory stands. Thank you for being such a smart cookie. You call me a smart cookie, holy heck. He chuckles warmly, reaching out and ruffling your hair. I'm glad you followed along. His hand idles in your hair a moment before he catches himself, pulling it away and regaining his posture. On another note, so, ain't an ass, but do you have a goal? Pardon? You're a little confused by his question. I, uh, I don't. I don't like all this, all the rumors I've been hearing. I don't like the idea of you going around unprotected. Damn, Florence coming on strong. Specifically, if I'm not there to help you. You watch as he pulls something from his holster. It's a gun, small and silver. Must be cleaned regularly or something. I want you to take this. Your eyes won. But isn't this yours? I have another. This is my spear. You can take it. I'll take the gun. You reach out, taking the gun. The metal feels strange and heavy in your hands. I'm assuming you don't have a holster. It looks at you the way you hold it. Brows pushed and serious. I'd offer to get you one, but... He seems to get an idea. Take mine. Wait. What? Before he can really stop him, he walks up, undoing his holster around his hip. Wait! He moves, hand guiding the belt around your hips. He's close to you, hands broad as he slips an arm around you, securing it around your waist. He pauses, looking into your eyes. A strange flush scrawls across his face as he lets go. So, uh, you just put it in here. Careful, it's loaded. He motions to the holster on your hip. He slowly nods, swallowing before you put the gun away. Thank you. You manage to choke out. You nod. Look away before taking a step back. I appreciate your help a lot today. Thank you again. As much as I'd love to stick here and chat, I have to get going so I can ride down a log. You nod, quickly understanding. I have to go. Stay safe, alright? It'll be here every weekend, so if you like, I can show you how to use the thing sometime. You quickly nod, and he turns, walk you up and leave you uptown. You find yourself in some fair town square. Would you like to go? Eh, I still haven't spoken to Jed yet. Oh gosh. Unlike usual, you weren't greeted with a shout. Let's speak to Officer Jedediah. You walk up to the officer, flashing a smile. He's gotta be cusping 50, right? The baggers can't be choosers. Still handsome. Yo, know, can I help you? He looks over to you, trying to figure out what you're all about. Huh. Show interest about his jump? So, does this town have a lot of crime? Seems like such a nice place. His interest is clearly piqued. He adjusts his posture. Well, this town is relatively small. Only about 30 at most if you, ever, if you round everyone up. Only a few bad apples, mostly young'uns, who have a little too much fun at that their salon. You nod. Nobody really means much harm, though. His eyes meet yours. What do you ask? He seems to be skeptical of you. Ah, uh, I want to be an officer someday. Well, sir, I just really want to be a sheriff someday. Oh, yeah? He sort of laughs. Well, you can apply to be junior deputy in a couple of years, okay, kid? That seems to be a nice way of saying, screw off, you brown noser. <laughs> or in a different sense, you aren't his type. 
Gosh darn it. Uh, wait, can I look into public records? You approach a hearty book in the corner of the room. Apparently, this is where the public records are stored. You flip through the pages. Only two things come into your attention. Crimes regarding a man named Will Curtis and an unknown source. Both take place in the woods. Huh. Well, it's... I want to speak to Officer Jedediah once more. He raises his eyebrows at you before looking away. There's no way you can talk to him right now. Approach Florence? He gives you a nod. Good to see you today, Lion. You're not back. Look away with a small blush. Well, I guess that's all I can do for today. Ah, uh, let's head back to the inn. Rest for the night. Uh, yeah, head back to the room. As you half asleep, you hear a strange noise. What in tarnation? You slur. Not exactly awake quite yet. What in the hell are you doing here? I could ask you the same for you, uh... Who even are you? His words are soft, and he almost seems to mumble them. Though, despite this, they're quite familiar. I'm their shepherd. And will you pipe down? You couldn't wake them up! Another familiar voice hisses in an irritable whisper. You swear you recognize that guy. Like the Bible? Yes, like the Bible! No, you idiot! Like the guy who watches sheep! The second voice snaps back sarcastically. Hold on! Aren't you the corpse fricker who lives in the woods? Why are you in the bedroom? What are both of them doing in the bedroom? The first voice seems to ignore the question entirely. I could ask the same of you, old man. Don't you have a grave to rob? I'm shocked you can get it up for someone who's still warm. You sit up, blinking a couple times before revealing the men at the foot of your bed. Are you dreaming? In front of you is both Dijon and Will dueling it out. Or at least, Dijon mercilessly digging into Will's core being. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, but if you're a shepherd or something, why are you in the bedroom? I mean, I understand you're always losing your sheep, but I don't think one will end up in the inn, let alone in this bedroom. Will seems to recall many situations where he heard bleating in the woods from poor lost sheep due to Dijon's nappage. Or so you can only assume. Dijon's face goes a little red at Will's words, and he huffs in irritation, glaring across the foot of the bed. They keep wandering off and getting lost when he should be with me. I was here to bring them back. I'm not one of his sheep, fam. Like, the last thing anyone would think of me is a sheep. And I don't lose my sheep that often. They only happen sometimes. Jean seems defensive about the sheep thing. Probably because it's true. I suggest counting them in the future so you won't lose so much. The way Will's toast is presented, he doesn't seem to want to jab. More of a genuine suggestion. I can count the number of women you wooed. It's zero. But on a real note, I can't count. Jean rubs the back of his neck. A little awkward about that. <laughs> Will seems to be thinking, hey, moving to scratch his live beer before he speaks again. Tone still quiet so he won't wake you. Too late for that, obviously. But you talk well. Though I doubt it compensates for your lack of numeral knowledge. I find myself at times finding much more company in books than people anyhow. I'd help you have that issue. Will doesn't seem to be good at pep talk, but he does know how to handle a strange situation being caught breaking an entry apparently. <laughs> you know what? Like, this is amazing. Like, honestly, like, yeah, I, I kind of had a feeling that both Dijon and Will, okay, Will, straight up stalker. Okay, like, Will, straight up stalking us. Uh, we got the notification earlier. But Dijon, Dijon here, like, I, I just had a hint that he might be stalking us. I didn't know that it was for real. Anyway, Dijon seems caught off guard by this. Sort of compliment? Ah, uh, thanks, I think. Uh, hey, you still haven't told me. Why the f are you in Lion's room? Don't, don't think you can distract me, you creep. Dijon seems to realize belatedly how far off topic he'd gone, and he strains up indignantly, as if Will intended to distract him. And in reality, it's probably just his spacey tendencies. <laughs> you know, this is absolutely hilarious. God, I need more situations like these. Because, God, it'll be so funny. Like, two stalkers ending up in your room. And, like, they have no idea what the other is doing there. <laughs> They're both trying to outsass each other. It's amazing. Frick. Well, 
Why should I tell you? Get our confessional, Booth. Will's voice gets surprisingly aggressive there, stepping back with an annoyed tone. One I like him most of the time. Seems he really doesn't like to air his dirty laundry himself. Jean's aggression seems to rise in turn. Frustration make him stiffen. Ah, you're a religious guy, aren't you? Funny, I thought sticking your willy in corpses was against the Bible. Behind his back, Lewis looks like Dijon is reaching for something. And you see the glint of dark metal in the gaps between the shirt and the waist of his pants. Your eyes widen a little. This strange and almost hum humorous scenario turning dark real quick. No, not anymore. Not since I was a child. So, around your age. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, God. I, I almost feel terrible for like ratting out on Will. Because God. Oh, why are you so lovable? Why do you have to be lovable? God, can't you be, like, any more irritating? I don't want to love you. You're making my betrayal painful. Frick. Will pauses, freezing in place when he notices the reflection. Not of the weapon in Dijon's grip. No, no. Of your eyes. His mouth sort of falls agape in shock, and he struggles to speak. Words bubbly up his throat, until he only lets out a meek sound of complete and utter fear. You're awake, listening to this whole fiasco. Dijon, ever unobservant, doesn't notice your eyes at all. Just the expression of fear on Will's face. Well, at least I'm not so old I should be sleeping in a mausoleum. Oh, wait, I bet you already do that. As he snaps back, Dijon's hand wraps around the handle of his weapon, and you feel a spur of panic. Ah! Uh, attempt to grab the gun, warn Will. I will warn Will. Your eyes flash from Dijon's hand to the gun in his waistband, and the words seem to fly out of your lips in wrist on impulse. Even as Dijon's gun whips out, you shout to warn Will. Look out, he's got a gun! You're not entirely sure why you warned him, but one thing you know for sure is that you don't want Will to get shot without a chance to defend himself. Will perks up at this, eyes widening as he fumbles, moving forward in a flash just as Dijon raises his weapon. Whoa! A loud bang rings through, and a loud grunt can be heard as Will wrestles Dijon to the floor, your window having been the victim of the firearm. You don't hear much. Well, not much aside from the sound of two men wrestling on the inn floor. You're not quite sure if you should scoot up to watch. Before you can ponder it much more, a strange, sickening sound catches your ears. Will slit Dijon's throat. A hobble, strangled, gurgling, emanates from Dijon as he gropes at his neck in a panic. His hand coming away, blood soaked. But soon, there's no more blood left to pump, and he loses the strength to move, going limp on the floor. Labored breaths are all Will can master as he stands up, looking from the corpse to you. Without a word, he grabs the body, hoisting it up with an awkward grunt before making his way to the window. First, he shoves the body out, it landing with a thump against the side of the building. Then, he gives you a parting glance before hopping out, leaving you alone in the room. Your first thought is, well... Well, somehow disgusting that this is all really happening. A second is explaining to Amon how the window broke. Despite this, you curl in the covers, knowing you won't get much sleep after all that. Left alone with your thoughts, at least until morning comes. Dijon. Dijon's dead. Anyway, that's the end of today's episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will be back with more Corn and Cowboy soon enough. Uh, so if you guys do want to see another episode of this, do let me know in the comments below. And of course, uh, hey, if you guys want to play this game for yourself, link to the game will also be in the description below. Anyway, I hope you guys have a lovely rest of the day. I'll be seeing you in the next video. But hopefully we get uh, justice for Dijon. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.